I want to get started with uh, our, our message today and our series that we're continuing today. And the series that we're continuing today is a series really uh, called Ever Ask Why? And I like to talk about the questions that many of us ask and that sometimes we're afraid to ask because we don't want to have people judge us or we're afraid because we're not 100% sure we want the answers. And um, the, today, the question that we're going to ask is a really important one. And I think that if you're honest, um, you probably have thought these questions. Maybe you do think them now. Maybe if not, you will if you're going into a dark place, as we often do. But um, does God care? Uh, is God really even there? Because we see the suffering in the world, we see the suffering in our own lives, we see the things that happen to us and around us, and it's very easy for us to draw our own conclusions and say, God just must not care about what's going on. And really throughout history, there have been three major questions that people have had to answer about God. And these three questions are really important because they define our relationship with him. The first one is, is God good? And we've talked about that before as a church family. And we started this series with this concept, with this idea that God, not only is he good, but he's holy. And that, that really answers the question to the biggest why. And that's why do we serve him? I believe wholeheartedly that God is good. You have to make that decision on your own because sometimes the things that God seems to allow don't seem to be good. The second one, is God knowledgeable? Does he know everything? Is there anything that surprises him? There's a whole school of liberal theology that's called, um, it's called progressive theology. And it, it talks about how God learns and grows and there's information that can surprise him and he develops over time. And it's a way that they explain away some of the complexities of our faith. And I find it to be lacking in many different ways because I believe what the Bible says about God. And that is that God knows everything that there's nothing that surprises him. There's no information unavailable to him. And not only does he know everything, but he knows what to do with everything. The third question you have to ask is, is God all powerful? Is there anything that God can't do? Now, I believe if we're gonna get really technical, the answer would be, yeah, there's something God can't do. And that is to do anything that would compromise or violate his own perfect nature. But for our practical purposes, God is all powerful and there's no obstacle in our circumstances, in our lives, with people, in our world, that God is not powerful enough to intervene in. And so if we believe that he's good, that he's powerful, that he knows everything, then it leaves us with a couple of questions. And that is, why would a good God who's all powerful and knows everything allow so much junk to happen to us and around us? Because if I were God, I wouldn't allow it. Now you should be thankful that I'm not God. But the reality is, it doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem fair. Historically, in Jesus' day particularly, the, the, the Greeks, the non-Jews, the Romans, they had a problem with Jesus saying he was God. And they said, anybody who says they're God should be smart enough to get out of trouble, not to be caught by the, the Romans and crucified. The Jews said anybody who's not powerful enough to be able to come down off the cross or to defeat their enemies shouldn't be trusted or considered as God. And it leaves you and I with the question, what is it in our own logic and our own minds that make us wonder whether or not God really is who he says he is? And if he is, why does he allow the kind of stuff that he allows? Sometimes I just don't understand. My mom and dad are here from California. My sons are here. My daughter-in-law, my son Nathan's girlfriend, Leah, and my granddaughter, as you've already met. We have nine people in our home, four animals, four dogs, loving every second of it. And it's fun to have everybody together. My mom was walking her dog, Mandy, who you heard about two weeks ago, the one who fell down the stairs. Remember that dog? Yeah, Mandy, uh, 14 years old. And my mom doesn't walk Mandy far because Mandy doesn't walk far. Mandy doesn't see well. She doesn't hear. Um, and uh, um, she has a tongue issue that hangs out the side of her mouth because her teeth have had to be removed. And, um, and she just doesn't like to walk that long. She has some arthritis. She's 14. She's given 14 good years of her life to my parents. So what do you do? You take good care of her and you take her for a walk. And if she wants to walk half a block, that's how far you walk her. And that's what my mom does. They're very, very good with Mandy. Mom was walking Mandy. They were about a block away from our house. And my mom heard something that um, was distressing. She heard a cat caught in a storm drain. 
And the cat was screaming at the top of his lungs in cat language, you know, meowing, which I'm not going to do for you, but you can imagine. And so my mom walks over to investigate and looks down and the cat who was down there in the storm drain couldn't get out. And um, when my mom looked down there, the cat saw my mom was afraid and kind of backed back up into the little tunnel, but kept on crying. Now, you know that I don't like cats, but you also, I hope, know that I would never let an animal suffer, cat or not, um, if I could do anything to intervene because a decent person wouldn't do that, no matter whether you like them or not, right? You just don't let any creature suffer. And so my mom couldn't do anything because she's not strong enough to lift the storm drain, but she did come home and I was there. And my mom has a soft and compassionate heart. She heard suffering. She knew that it was wrong. She didn't have the strength to be able to lift the storm drain. So she told me and she said, hey, there's a cat that's stuck. So I went and investigated and in fact, the cat was stuck. And so I called all the numbers you're supposed to call. And would you be surprised? Probably not that nobody answered. Animal control didn't answer. I even called the Ankeny Police Department who transferred me to the Sheriff's Department. They didn't even answer. I need like a city serve hotline or something. We got to get some kind of a, of a hotline worked out. We got a cat in the cell, but yeah. Um, so we didn't have any help. But my mom, she looked at me and she's like, maybe you can do something, Rick. And so what kind of person would I be if I looked at my mom and said, nah, I'm gonna leave the cat there. Let it die. But sometimes it seems like that's the answer we get when we pray. I went to the storm drain, looked down the storm drain, heard the suffering, knew that it was wrong, tried to lift the storm drain, could lift the storm drain, set it in the street to free the cat because it's what any decent person would do. Now, the cat wouldn't jump out of the storm drain. It was a little kitten. I don't know if it was too scared, if it was not strong enough, but I sat there on the side of the road with an open storm drain waiting for the cat to free itself. Wouldn't come out. I can't leave an open storm drain in the middle of Prairie Trail. I'm going to catch a kid. You know, they're going to be flying down on their scooters and you'll boop down in the, and I'd probably get in trouble for that. At least the HOA would have something to say. So I cover it back up and I'm thinking, what can I do? So I go back and I lift the storm drain a second time and put it on the side of the, the road and wait for the cat to come out. The cat wouldn't come out. I'm pouring water down the drain because it was so hot early in the week. And I was worried the cat was going to die of dehydration. I would drive by with my wife. We would roll down the windows of the truck and listen for the sound of the suffering. Finally, I decided what I was gonna do. I took a board and took a, it was a four by four, like a post that you use for a fence. And I cut it to where I thought it would just fit at the back of the storm drain where there was a little bit of an opening. And I stapled some insulation all the way down the board so that the cat would have something to put its claws into. And I lifted the storm drain and put the board in there at an angle where, you know, even a cat that wasn't the brightest, you know, cat in the cat pack would be able to figure out how to get out. And I left it there because it's what a decent person would do. But how come sometimes when we hear the sound of suffering and we point it out to God and we say, God, hey, there's somebody in a storm drain. It seems to us that he drives by without stopping. And I don't know about you, but it leaves me with a little bit of heartburn. The number one reason why people walk away from our faith and it's the number one reason why many people don't come to faith in the first place. So today, I don't mean to bum you out. I just want to be real with you. And I want to talk about an issue that I think you've probably thought about. And if you haven't, you may think about. And if you haven't thought about it and you may not think about it, your friends are thinking about it because it's a very common issue to discuss. And I want to walk through it today. And I'm not going to walk through it like some pastors to try to slap some spiritual band-aids, some trivial truisms, a little scripture out of context just to make you feel better and send you on your way. We're going to wrestle through this and come to some truths that I think will empower you as we continue to build some blocks in the foundation of your biblical worldview to help us be able to see the world around us and make sense of it. Because sometimes, if you're honest, it's really hard to make sense of it. The Apostle Paul, he understood he had come through a time 
in his life where he had had six different um, visions from the Lord about heaven and spiritual things. And a seventh one was listed in second Corinthians. And Paul was talking about, you know, how he didn't want to become arrogant or conceited that there were other people, other spiritual leaders who had said they had visions. And, you know, if you had a vision, I had a vision and they couldn't prove it. And Paul, you know, was kind of in a confused time. And he finds himself in a time where he felt like that God should be more present in his life and more powerful in his life. But in reality, it looked like God was abandoning him in his life. And he had to make some decisions and they're the same decisions that you and I have to make. And we've covered this passage two other times in the last seven years together. And it's helpful for us to cover it in this way today from a little different perspective. And so even if you think you know it, bear with me because the Holy Spirit will show you, I think, another facet that will help complete your picture as you work through this. A thorn in the flesh was given to me. This is the apostle Paul talking. A messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be conceited. Concerning this thing, I pleaded, and the word pleaded is the word for begged. It's a strong word. It's not like, hey, I asked God, hey, if you know you could get around to it, would you take it away from me? If you ask somebody, it's like, I'll do anything. What do you want from me? Anything I can do, please take it away. Please take it away. Please take it away. I mean, he pleaded with God three times that it might depart from me. And then I wish that there was a space in between verse eight and verse nine, but there's not. Because see, the apostle Paul was going through this experience before he wrote about it. He came back and wrote about it later. He wasn't just free pinning the experience going, everything's fine. Oh, all things work together for good. And this is how I'm gonna, he was like looking back and reflecting. It was his conclusions. And so there was a gap or a space in between verse eight and verse nine. I'm absolutely sure after he asked three times for God to take it away and he had to decide, what am I gonna do if the answer is not what I want? What am I gonna do if God's not in the suffering and pain relieving business today? What choice am I gonna make? Because some people leave and say, because God doesn't do what I want, he's not a God that I want, so I'll be my own God. And they leave and walk away from the faith. Some people never come to the faith in the first place because they've seen the answer to this question in some cases that they don't think is fair and don't think is right. And so it's in that defining moment in your life after you've asked and you're waiting that you have to choose what it is that you're going to do. What do you do when you don't hear what you want to hear when you want to hear it? Well, let's go back and let's see what Jesus said. And Jesus said to him, no, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Now, if I were Paul, I would be listening, saying grace is good, right? Strength is good, but I'm still stuck in the bottom of a storm drain screaming till my voice gets hoarse. I want out. So what do you do? Of course you want out. It's human. It's natural. It's okay. And I don't know about you, but for me, I have a much harder time dealing with other people's suffering than I do my own. And I don't mean to sound like holy or like I'm some kind of martyr or saint because you know me and you know that I'm not. But when things happen to me, it's, you know, okay. And maybe I got them coming, maybe I don't. But I mean, I've learned how to deal with most things. But when they happen to people I love, innocent people, something my wife's going through, my kids, oh my goodness, it hurts worse than anything. And you want to take it away. You want God to take it away. And you run into, as I do, huge crises of faith. And you're like, God, your, your grace, perfect. Your strength, perfect. But we're still cats in, in the storm drain. And so the apostle Paul, as he's talking to the Lord and he hears this answer, no. Jesus said, my grace. My grace is sufficient. It's more than enough. It's what I promise you for today. My promise for you today is that anything that you're going through today, you're going to have the grace to be able to endure. 
And that today I give you the gift of faith that if you have faith in me, that tomorrow, when tomorrow gets here, if you are going through something that seems too unimaginable to endure, you'll have my grace tomorrow. Because so many times when we're going through things and God's using these things, it's not for our benefit. It's not just for us. It's not just for our comfort, but it's for the people around us and the character that God's building and the witness of the world trying to see what difference Jesus makes. And so Jesus is saying to him, listen, my grace will get you through. I'll give you more than you need. My strength is what people see in you when you're at the end of your rope, when you have nowhere to go, when you experience weakness. And when you throw your hands up and say, I can't, that's when I do. And it doesn't mean that he's taking you out of the drain. It means he's giving you everything you need to endure. And when the world around us sees that, isn't that real power and isn't that real strength? But it's not always our first choice. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. The apostle Paul formed a conclusion that he understood. John the Baptist understood. And I'm not gonna read you this story because we don't have time. John the Baptist was the cousin of Jesus, a relative of Jesus who prepared the way for the Lord. It's in your notes if you have the app. His job was to preach and he was the Old Testament kind of preacher. He was a hellfire and brimstone preacher. He would tell you how it is and burn the hair right off your head. And if you didn't like it, that was your problem. He would let you know exactly how things were. Great preacher, his dad was a preacher, came from a line of preachers. He would go out into the wilderness and preach, dressed up in clothes that, well, they were uncomfortable and live in a way that was sort of removed. And he was abrasive, but he was right. And his job was to prepare the way for Jesus Christ. Jesus called him a great man, so much so that not many, if any, have ever lived greater than him. Now, he got involved a little bit with uh, one of the politicians of the day and sort of criticized him out loud about some immorality that was going on. You've heard the story from me before. Thrown into prison where he stayed for about a year, but he had a mission, an urgent mission to prepare the way for Jesus, to preach the good news of the coming of the kingdom. And the kingdom was supposed to be here. Jesus was here, which according to the Old Testament and the way he read it meant that there would be visible signs that Jesus had come. The government would change, that the society would be different, that people would, would be able to breathe a little easier. And so he's looking for these signs. He's in prison. His life is being threatened. If you're the person who's supposed to prepare the way for Jesus. And on top of that, you're related to him. And you know, he's doing miracles all over the place. Wouldn't you expect a miracle? I mean, the day of your execution is coming or at least the threat of your execution. You're languishing in a prison out in the middle of nowhere. So he sends his friends to Jesus to check Jesus out and to make sure he's not making a mistake because Jesus wasn't really being the kind of Jesus that he thought Jesus ought to be. And so they went and they questioned Jesus and they said, are you the real deal? John wants to know. And Jesus gave them some satisfying answers that were also unsatisfying and says, do you see all the things that I'm doing in the world, all the people who are turning and coming to me? And even though I'm not coming to you right now, he said, blessed is he who isn't offended by the decisions that I make, who trusts me, even though it doesn't make sense, who accepts my grace and my strength in the middle of our moments of disillusionment or disappointment. And you may or may not know what happened. Now the cat, we have good news. As a matter of fact, I even have proof. I didn't see the cat. I didn't tell the first service what happened to the cat and people were really upset at me. They were like, what happened to the cat? And I said, that's not the point. And they said, yes, it is. We wanna know what happened to the cat. The cat's fine. It ended up on the Prairie Trail blog, which is the safest place in the world for a stray cat to uh, come up on and be publicized. And so here's my neighbor who posts, terrified, hurt and screaming kitten on my front porch enjoying milk. Does anyone know this kitten? It in fact was the cat that I arranged the escape for. I take credit for its escape. 
My mom probably should get the credit because she pointed me in the right direction and the cat's fine. Somebody in our neighborhood will adopt a slightly damaged cat who has a phobia of storm drains, may need a little therapy, a little post-traumatic stress disorder, but eventually the cat will be fine. What about John the Baptist? He had his head cut off because of some perverted parlor game and a strip tease. You don't believe me, read it for yourself. And it didn't end well for him. And here's one of the most sacrilegious things I think I've ever said in a church service. And when I wrote it in my notes, I had to ask God if it was okay. It's the thought I wanna leave you with before we sing. You do not always have to like God to love him. And I don't want you to judge that statement. I want you to think about it. We talked about agape love for weeks and weeks and weeks and how agape love, the kind of love given to us, the kind of love we give to God is not based on emotion. It's not based on what we get. It's not based on convenience. It's based on commitment. We do what's right because it's right for as long as it's right because that's who we are. When I don't do what my wife expects me to do as a husband, she doesn't walk away. She doesn't turn her back. She doesn't cut me out of her life because there was a commitment that was made. And there are times I promise you when she would say to you, I don't really like him. Maybe even today, I don't know. But I promise you, she would say, I love him. We're gonna pick this theme up and I'm not gonna leave you low. I'm gonna give you hope and some tools, but we're gonna sing first. Okay, so I should remind you just like I did last week at this time that the stuff I'm talking to you about can seem a little overwhelming if you're just looking for a one and done. Uh, this is not something that you just come to church one Sunday and you hear and you go, hey, I'm fixed, I got it. Like a Band-Aid you may slap over a small cut. It's something that develops within you over time. And it's a continuation of the process that we began together in January when I uh, invited you into a year of spiritual growth and promised you that if you keep coming and you lean in and you open your heart, that each week God's gonna continue to do something in you that's gonna help you become a different person. You're gonna see the world differently. You're going to think differently. And it is something we do together as a group. It's not something we do by ourselves. And so whether or not it's your first time here or joining us online, I don't want you to be overwhelmed because what I'm talking about today is supernatural. It is replacing the natural, normal response of a human and God growing something in us that is truly supernatural to when we respond to the world around us in a way that's different and more powerful than we ever could on our own. And, and that's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. We went shopping this last week because when the kids come in town and uh, uh, Emery comes in town, we go to the mall. Uh, Emery, we found out she loves to ride the escalator, which is a whole lot cheaper than the fare. Uh, in Mountain Home, Arkansas, I don't think they have an escalator. And so it just happened, it happened just accidentally the first time I had her by the hand. We rode down the escalator, you know, and I, I watch her and she's looking around, you know, and, and she's like, man, and then we got to the end and she goes, we made it like that. And I thought, man, she's having fun. And so we rode the escalator yesterday at Jordan Creek, up and down and up and down. And she had a blast. We got pictures and everything. And uh, we, you know, of course, had to uh, go to um, celebrate my boy's birthday at Cheesecake Factory. It's where, where we go when they come in town. They enjoy that. They don't have a Cheesecake Factory in the city they live in. And so my mom and dad, uh, they're here and Emery and Joy and Nathan and Leah and Richard and Eden. And, and uh, it, we were all there um, and uh, having a great time. I'm probably skipping somebody in my own family. But uh, we were eating and as the waitress came up to the table, um, little Emery down in her high chair, when the waitress walked up to ask us what we want to order, she turns around and holds her little hand up and she said, we just want pasta. She, like yelled at her, that's what we just want. So the little waitress, she kind of smiled and stepped back a little bit and she went, okay, do you just want pasta? So Emery repeated it for emphasis. We just want pasta. Like she repeated it for the whole table. She was ordering for our table. I didn't want pasta, um, but Emery was determined. And so Eden, of course, looks over at Emery and says, Emery, would you like some mac and cheese? And so Emery thought for a second, turned to the waitress and said, we just want mac and cheese. You know, he yelled at the lady, which technically is pasta. But if you're two and a half, it's different than, you know. Um, but we know what we want. 
We know what the whole table wants. We want out of the storm drain. We want the pain to go away. We want the suffering to stop. Me, my whole table. And then all of a sudden we know something else. And when we know something else, we have to decide what we're gonna do with that new piece of information. So I'm gonna give you something else in this next section. And I wanna just see what you choose to do with this information as we hopefully bring this to a conclusion that's helpful for you. I certainly don't want it to be discouraging or overwhelming. So back to the Apostle Paul as a review, a thorn in the flesh, a thorn, a stake, an impaling stake was given to him in the flesh, for the flesh, of the flesh, um, a messenger of Satan to torment him. Concerning this, he asked God to take it away three times. We've already talked about this, but I want you to take yourself to the place where you in your own life have asked God to do something and you have begged God to do something and God's chosen not to do it. God fixed my marriage, God healed my kid, saved my job, get me out of the hospital. The most serious thing you can think of, maybe you're in the middle of that right now. And you ask God one time, hope and anticipation. You ask him a second time with hope and anticipation. You ask him a third time again with hope and anticipation. And then you wait, the ellipsis, the dot, 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 just like someone's texting you, right? And you're waiting for the message to pop up with hope and anticipation. We all want pasta. And then the answer pops up and it's not what we expected. A new piece of information that we have to decide what to do with. And Jesus said to him, my grace is gonna be more than you ever need. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Paul says, therefore I'll boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And here's the conclusion. Therefore I take pleasure in the things in my life that are not the way that I want them to be. Obviously my paraphrase. For when I am weak, then I am strong because it's not my strength and my wisdom and my plan that I'm relying on, it's God's. And it doesn't have to make sense. It doesn't even have to seem right. It just is. So what do we do about it? First of all, my question to you, do you want to heal? Because these things cause injury in our life. These things cause damage. They cause wounds. Whether it's a fear of storm drains or post-traumatic stress from a terrible relationship that ended in a way that was unfair. Or death. It leaves a mark. Do you want to heal? Healing can begin in the middle. It doesn't have to begin at the end. There's a poem that I love written by Dylan Thomas and it's called Rage Against the Dying of the Light. And one of the lines, rage against the dying of the light. Do not go quietly into that good night. At 54 years old, that's one of those things I hang on to. And I'm like, I'm gonna push back the walker every single day. I'm gonna rage against the dying of the light. But I think in a sense, that's what Jesus expects us to do because we're human, he gets it. And so we rage against what happens that's not right, that's not fair, that we don't want in our lives. And he's okay with that as long as it doesn't become who we are. It's just a stage that we pass through. And he's with us, I even believe, in our anger and our frustration and our disappointment and our disillusionment. And when we say to him, God, I don't like you, make it go away. But if our rage becomes a lifestyle, then it becomes bitterness, resentment. Instead of our hearts becoming soft, they become hard. The very thing that can make you beautiful can make you, well, it'll destroy you. So he says, all right, rage against the injustice. Are you ready to do something about it? No, I just wanna stand back in a post-Christian world and point my finger at you, God because you're not who I thought you were. No, I wanna stand back and judge all those Christians who hang on to these truths that seem so preposterous. And Jesus said, are you ready to do something about it? Yes, I am. So let's begin to heal. Now, when we heal, maybe we ask different questions because as you begin to heal, 
we can't really ask why questions. I hope this is making sense. I hope I'm communicating. My biggest fear right now is that I lose you in the moment when I need you with me more than anything else. Because we ask why questions. And at the beginning, when we ask why questions, the answers we get are never good enough because they're not the answers that we usually want. They only have to make sense to us and our own sense of fair and right for us to accept them. So we have to stop asking those questions and begin to ask other questions, which takes courage and resolve. And the apostle Paul demonstrated this in 2 Corinthians. In the ellipsis, whatever God says I'm going to accept, I am beginning to heal. It begins now. The next question, and this is what the apostle Paul demonstrated in 2 Corinthians and through his life. And that is, are you willing to wait? Because healing doesn't ever happen fast, does it? Oh man, God, give me blessings and give it to me now. (laughs) That's what I want. I'm one of the most impatient people you could ever meet in your entire life. My whole family would testify to that. You should drive somewhere with me. It's just, there's probably a a diagnosis in a book somewhere about what's wrong with me, but I don't like to wait. Here's what happens when we wait. It's what the apostle Paul found out. It's what he promises us in Philippians chapter four. He says, listen, when you wait, when you're dealing with things in your life, don't be anxious about any of them. It's a choice. You don't have to be. But in every situation, every disappointment, every disillusionment, every pain. By prayer and petition, of course we tell them to God because he loves us and he's God. With thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. I'm gonna read that again. And the peace of God, which blows the human mind beyond the human comprehension, will stand guard over your hearts in Christ Jesus while you wait. So God promises us grace and strength and peace. And then James tells us that wisdom comes, a view of life from God's perspective but that wisdom comes to those who ask after we're willing to wait and have made a decision that we want to heal and not stay in our pain. And when wisdom comes, it's almost always different than what we anticipated or expected. A new piece of information on the menu that we now have to decide if we want. And the reality is, is that if you and I had God's power, we would eliminate all suffering. But the truth is that if we had God's wisdom, we wouldn't. And that blows my mind because I see and I see clearly, but I don't see comprehensively. So what are the two things that Paul learned? Two things that are really important. And I wanna share them with you as we close. The first is that God is always present in our pain. that we're never alone unless we choose to go through it like we're alone, allowing the rage to continue and the disillusionment to linger and the bitterness and the hard-heartedness to develop. That if we lean in instead of leaning away, that God, his presence, he's always with us, even in the middle of the worst things that happen to us. The second thing we know for sure, and we've seen it from the life of the Apostle Paul, as Jesus explained his purpose in 2 Corinthians, was that God in fact does have a purpose even in the things that that we go through. So what do we know for sure? Well, you don't have to like God to love him. that statement stress anybody out? It sounds a little bit sacrilegious, doesn't it? It sounds like a pastor shouldn't be saying it. I'm not 100% sure I'm okay. I ask God, I'm like, God, is this all right? But it's just honest, isn't it? 
It's okay to curse our limitations. It's okay to curse the effect that sin has on the world. Original sin, our sin, the way it destroys and divides its destructiveness. But it's not okay to curse God. That's not an unpardonable sin, but it's not okay to curse God. But we don't always have to like him or to agree with him, to love him. And we don't always have to like God or to agree with him, to trust him. We have to choose to love him and decide to stay and not walk away like so many people do. We have to prepare ourselves for the dark places because you've been there and you know what it's like, or if not, you're going there and we'll be there with you, but being prepared certainly helps. And we do the best we can, but our best is never enough that we have to have God's strength. We have to have grace. We need God's peace to know that we're part of a plan. And this is my favorite line from this entire message. And it's the one that I've hung on to all week long. This is the way that I understand, that I reconcile all of this, this issue. I see clearly, I'm not dumb, I see it. I see what happens over there. I see what happens here. I see what happens with my friends and my family. I see what happens in my own life. I'm not dumb, I see it. I see very clearly. It's wrong, I wish it would change. I'd probably change it if I could. It's not that I'm not paying attention. My problem is I don't see comprehensively. I don't have God's wisdom. I have Rick's wisdom. I'm not all knowing. I only see one item on the menu. God gave me righteous indignation and he gave me compassion only to be given back to him so that he can provide understanding. And I have to be willing to wait and watching for wisdom. And I have to choose to stay. And you have to decide what you're gonna choose to do as well. The title of the sermon, does God care and is he there? My short answer is yes. But the real question is, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do together? Father, thank you for the time we've spent together and I just pray for my friends. I love them, Father. I'm just, this, this question that we all ask is just so overwhelmingly difficult to process. And I just pray right now that you would just draw my friends close to you. Just literally wrap your arms around them and draw them in close. I pray that you give them a sense of your presence, that they would understand your love. They would realize that you are in fact God, that you are good, holy, truly good and loving, that you are all powerful and that one day everything wrong will be made right that the home that you've prepared for us in heaven, for those of us who put our faith and trust in you is waiting for us and that you will either take us to be with you or come to collect us. That one day this world will be a distant memory. Nothing is outside your knowledge or your understanding, but so much is outside of mine, of ours. I pray that we would take our rage, our indignation and our compassion. And instead of standing back and judging you and judging your word, that we would offer them to you as a gift, incomplete as they are, so that you can use them to help fix what's broken in this world. So that in our own weakness, your strength can be seen and that many can come to a saving relationship with you. I pray that we as a church, that we as individuals would commit ourselves to it that we would choose to love you and choose to stay. We sing this last song to you as a song of commitment because of who you are and we need to say it. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me, please.